Hello, and welcome back to Blood for Flowers by M.C. McNeil. That's me. We are continuing with chapter 15, so come with me now on a journey through time and space as we go back to ancient Greece on the shores of the Aegean. Now, after the ladies had their fill of food and frolicking in the water, some went back to their little tents and slept off the exhaustion of too much drink and too much sex, if such a thing exists. However, Thera and about 20 of her women, most of the former virgins, remained resting upon the warm, wet sand as they lie in the sun, the women's bodies coated in rich, nourishing olive and jojoba oil the relaxing rays of Apollo glistening off their golden skin as the soft, soothing sound of the waves of the Aegean washed upon the shore. Now as Thera calmed her mind there beside the blue sea, she heard a familiar voice, and she knew it was he. Admiral, Admiral, I believe the lady you seek has fallen asleep in the sun. Thera heard the blue-eyed Zela tell Vasha, I am not sleeping, Thera said as she opened her eyes, standing to her feet, completely naked. Vasha took in a deep breath as he stood there in front of the magnificent naked woman, as he held the reins of two of the horses Thera had brought from Themyscira. I would like you to take a ride with me so that we may have a better understanding of one another, for I feel I have offended you in some way. He paused as Thera smiled, hands on her hips, shaking her head. Thera interrupted, no, good sir. It is I who has caused the offense. You must forgive me for last night, for it is true. I was brought under the spell of your king. She paused, knowing Guasha had no idea of to what degree. I see you have brought Clarion and Octavius. Yes, dear Thera, if you would accompany me on a ride so we might speak further before tonight's feast, he smiled, seeing a true warmth of feeling coming from the naked, red-haired, green-eyed lady. A moment, please, and I will be more than honored to ride with thee. Thera bade Basha wait as he watched as she bent down, rubbing the sand into her soft, smooth skin, doing this to remove the dead skin and oil from her body. Then she went for a dip in the open sea that was shining smooth as silver, as she rinsed the grit and grime from her body, Thera walked out up. Thera walked up out of the ocean, wet and glistening, hair dripping like seaweed. And she went to the fire where a few maidens helped her dry herself on the long gauze linen hanging by the fire. Basha watched as the women put a mixture of lanolin and olive oil in her wet hair, combing it back, gathering the wet red mass of tresses out of her face. Thera opened a jar, rubbing a soothing lotion on her face and a peppermint balm on her lips. She chewed a few mint leaves to freshen her breath and then slipped into a long linen gown. She girded up her loins by pulling the back of the dress up between her legs to the front, slipping the material up underneath the golden belt around her waist. Then, and only then, was Thera ready to take a ride with Vasha through the cypress and pine covered mountains, beside the lake surrounded by the endless meadows of violets tulips, peonies, primrose, and bluebells. Now this all helped open up Thera's hard heart to Vasha, but this was only because of a promise to King Viacles. Okay, so let's see what happens on their little ride. So chapter 15 continues. Thera and Vasha rode on talking of common things with one another, and she thought he was pleasant enough company. Thera could see herself naked with him, but one thing was lacking in her vision. There was no passion or danger with the admiral. Admiral liked the feelings which stirred in her heart for King Viacles. Now, no matter the subject, war, horsemanship, her homeland, etc., Thera's thoughts always flowed back to the king. Thera found herself for a great, great while wondering what had become of Vi since he had crept from her bed so early in the morning. Early in the morning. As it so happened, the king of Sparta did creep from her bed, but it was not to his bed that he returned. The king instead left the path which led to his home, and he ventured down to the sea. 
Viacles walked into the cold, moonlit waters, wrapped in the red crimson stained fabric around his waist, and he washed the scent of Thera from his skin and beard. Mm. Many thoughts raced through his mind as he swam in the cold, deep blue sea. After a while, when he could stand the cold no longer, Vi swam back to shore, soaking wet as he, exhausted, fell fast asleep on his back on the sand, the sound of the waves crashing against the beach. In what seemed to him but a moment of rest, he woke to the rays of the sun warming his skin, and he awoke to see the glorious sunrise as he set up to behold the magnificent scene. The fresh ocean wind was strong with the warm air currents up from Africa, from the Sahara. Viacles awoke with a deep sense of unrivaled satisfaction in his heart and mind. However, the most dreaded language in the English language, the most dreaded word in the English language. However, when the guilt of shame was realized again, all his happiness was dashed away, and he knew that happiness he had achieved would never return to him again. So the king had at this point resigned to return to his wife and face her pains. When he finally, when he did finally return to the bedchamber, he had been hours gone from, he found his wife Kiva asleep in her bed. Here he noticed a cup of medicine dispensed by Kadarius. This was a common sight as his wife's excruciating endometriitis kept her in much pain most of the days of her life. Viacles often wondered what curse had befallen him that he should be rewarded with this most beautiful, intelligent, barren woman out of all the women of Greece. Now the king did, did love his queen, but had Vi known of her ailment, he would have chosen the younger Arcadian princess instead. But the king knew the past was long in its grave, and so he bade his wife to awaken, nudging her gently. She awoke with a deep yawn, but a stretch, a bright, cheerful smile upon her face. She hugged her husband, who smelled of salt in the sea, saying, Good morning, my king. She kissed him softly and sweetly. Your guest, the Princess Thera, how is she? Your physician said she was in terrible pain and you had to escort her back to the encampment last night. She asked with great concern in her voice for the welfare of his guest, or so it would seem. I was so worried, I myself <clears throat> was unable to sleep. Your concern is deeply appreciated. And as you, she could find no rest. I stayed most of the night talking of common things with Commander Thera. Vi smiled, lying to his wife. I was finally able to bring her to rest with one of my long, boring stories. Then I went for a swim before dawn and fell asleep on the beach. That part of the story was true. He smiled with a laugh. <laughs> yes, my king, come. I will draw a bath for you and wash your body for you reek of seaweed. Kiva laughed as her husband embraced her, transferring the odor onto her nightgown and long black hair. So it was the king found himself, but moments later in his large marble tub, naked with his wife, who knelt in the water behind him as he reclined back onto her as she washed the ocean from his hair and beard. He sighed deeply, realizing what a perfect wife Kiva could be. But the only flaw she had was she could not bring forth a child unto Viacles. Then, as she rinsed him off, she asked Vi, Has Thera selected a partner for the, uh, from our warriors as of yet? No. Thera has not chosen a partner from among our warriors yet. The king answered his queen, skirting the truth from her with her own words, a clever trick he once learned from a politician. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So that's chapter 15. Um, we're gonna go on to chapter 16. I hope you like this. Um, <laughs> they're gonna get into a lot of trouble with a capital T. Mm-hmm.